This message is brought to you by danmolerarchive.com, the number one place to search over 2,500 Dan Moeller messages in growing. Now, please enjoy this message. Never in my life was I even thinking, and I know there's a truth about fruit and legacy. When you're in love with Jesus, when you receive his love and grow in him, <coughs> excuse me, you're going to be fruitful. If the seed dies and falls to the ground, that's what needs to happen. Then it's going to spring up and bear much fruit. So I never in my life thought about, really thought about fruitfulness. I just thought about loving him. So when somebody comes in the office distraught and suicidal, you always have something to give. And if you're free, you'll minister freedom. And they might not grab it right away, but you'll just keep ministering freedom because you're free. I remember the first time Todd called me after he got water baptized and admitted that he was using and he was crying really hard. It was the very first time he called me and confessed to me that he was slipping up. And I remember feeling so good in my heart because I could hear how hard he was crying and I thought, this is, this is going to be good. I said, well, listen, let me ask you a question, man. Because he was hurting. He was broken that he used. He felt like he was failing. And who knows it's not cool to use? Who knows you could talk all day about, man, you shouldn't be doing that. Why are you at church singing loud? Now you're using, man, you're going to cause people to stumble. You're a hypocrite. You need to knock it off. I just asked him real simple. When's the last time you cried about using? He said, Never. I said, man, you've come a long way already. You're just about there, man. You're caring about what you never cared about. I understand you used, but if you let using decide who you are and not let this truth, man, I see the tears. You're being changed on the inside. That's what's going to take you to change. So just remember that, guys. Don't get caught up on the surface. When somebody comes to me as a pastor crying and they confess their life to me, I usually look at them and smile and say, man, I'm so excited to see how the gospel's purifying your heart. And they usually say, purifying my heart, didn't you hear what I just did? Well, I heard what you did, but I see who you are. And if you take on the identity of what you did, you'll miss the identity of what he did, and you're back to square one, and you'll never change. Tom said it when he came out here, bless his heart, not when he was rapping. It sounded good. I was wishing he would have kept going. I thought he actually started off good. I was like, what? <laughs> and then he stopped too fast. He, Tom, you stopped too fast. I thought he was going to wrap out the offering. I was so proud of him. <laughs> People say I'm a man of faith or something like that. I don't have any faith to do what Tom did. <laughs> I was, he was my new hero, second to Jesus. I was like. <laughs> but he came out and, and the worship was amazing, right? This is amazing, right? Just everybody being in love with him together is amazing. It's amazing. It's, well, let me, let me do this first because it's, it's pressing me right now. The unity of faith is what we're going after. That doesn't mean we all think the same, act the same, look the same. He's not talking uniformity. He's talking unity of faith. Uniformity and unity are two different things. Uniformity is what Hitler tried. It wasn't a good idea. Unity is everybody in all their differences and diversity living for the same reason. Yeah? Yeah. Can you help me quick? Just come here. I'll come down and make it easy for you. Come here, man. Just stand right here and put your face beside mine. Would you ever confuse us? <laughs> Do we look anything alike? So if you got to know us, would you mix us up and say, oh man, that's right, I'm sorry, you're not Dan. <laughs> you wouldn't do that? So the truth is, we don't look anything alike, but we can both look like him. Yeah. That's the unity of faith. Jesus doesn't take away your individuality. He just makes you look like what he looks like in you. So here's the deal. Do you live here? Yeah. Where do you live? I'm in Oklahoma. Oh, you live in Oklahoma. Good. Watch this. Watch this. How many live in Texas? Yeah. 
How many live somewhere else in Texas? Just a couple hands quick. Who's outside, who's, who's outside of Oklahoma and Texas? Yeah? What? Just name out like two more states. <laughs> yeah. Whoa! I didn't hear A. Washington. Okay, you couldn't hear nothing, could you? It was just, Wah! <laughs> Arkansas, Washington, Texas, Oklahoma. Everybody else matters. I just don't have you in the illustration, but you matter. Texas, Oklahoma, Washington, and Arkansas. We're all going to leave this power and love and go back to our respective homes. We might not even see each other for who knows when, but watch. On Sunday morning, Monday morning, Tuesday morning, every one of us, no matter where we are, can wake up for the same exact reason. To pursue his image and walk in love. Let me tell you what that is. That's an army. And it's called the unity of faith. And honestly, we don't look anything alike, but we can both look just like him. Amen? Thank you. You get it? So Tom, Tom came out and he said, he was just walking slow. I mean, it's hard to come out in an atmosphere like Adam worship. You just want to just sit here and let the girls keep dancing and the guys and, and just, Jesus. Chris was like, I'm done. I'm done. And I'm thinking, yeah, we're all about done right now. Tom comes out, and you could see it on Tom. He's just walking slow, and he's like, he talked about the tenderness and loving kindness of God. And I think about it all the time. I don't know if you understand this, but the mercy of God is what the devil can never defeat and never will defeat. I understand he can't defeat the power of God and everything, but it's who God is that makes him so amazing. Satan cannot stop the mercy of God. Everybody in this room has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And if you're born again, you have the spirit of God in you and God sees you as if you've never sinned. How do you beat that? We're all worthy of judgment and yet it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. How do you stop that kind of love? How do you stop that kind of mercy? The only way it can be stopped is when you fail to receive it and believe it's true. And fail to start taking on the identity of what he's done through his son. And you take on the identity of where you've been and what you've done. It's the only way it can stop, but yet he'll never stop loving you. There's a big difference between me getting up here and shouting, God loves you. And everybody going, ah. It's a big difference between me saying that and you being loved by God. You being loved by God is what will transform your life. It's one thing to say he loves you. It's another thing for you to be loved by God. What's that mean? You receive everything he did, everything we're saying all week, and everything he paid for. You cannot stop the mercy of God. I never understood it till I got saved, and Holy Spirit taught me that the reason God's love never fails, he always sees me for what he created me to be. And when I live outside of that, even in my former life when sin abounded, grace was greater and abounded much more. Not to empower sin and enable me to stay there, to overwhelm sin and get me out of there. Yeah? Come on. This is really good news. It's like, I didn't find a way to sin and get away with it. I found a way to be free. To be free. Well, brother, you'll never be free from sin. Maybe you should read your Bible and start walking and living in the Spirit and get close to Holy Spirit so you're not even thinking sin anymore and the question and the comments die on sin. It's amazing how we're so quick to boast in our ability to fail and think it's humility. It's deception. You're taking on an identity he paid for you to get free from, and as a man thinketh, so he is. It's a subtle trap. Religion clings to it. Well, brother, everybody sins. We're always sinning. We're probably sinning now and don't even know it. You're probably sinning while you're breathing, brother. How can you reckon yourself dead indeed to sin and maintain that confession? Let me just quote 1 Peter 2 for you. He bore our sin and your sin and my sin in his body on a tree. Why? That we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness. Hear all the purpose in this? 
It's not just, wow, thanks for dying for me. No, there's a reason. So you die to the mentality, the identity, the stain and the sting of sin, the desire. You come out of darkness into the light and say, man, I was never created for the impulses of my flesh. I was created to live out of my spirit. In Galatians 5, if I live in the spirit, I will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why don't we step out in faith and stop boasting in our ability to fail and see how far grace can take us? You can't even talk about this from the pulpit, Harley. There's so many red flags and warnings and heresy things and blasphemy things out there. People are like, Wah! why? Because we're lording our human experience over his ability to change us. And, and I'm actually, the cameras are running, and I feel a little like, really, actually, not a little. I feel super confident right now because, honestly, I'm not ashamed to talk about it. I've been saved for 23 years. I know my life in God, and I'm either a fool and don't fear the Lord, or one day I'll stand before him, and you'll find out I wasn't kidding. But you do not have to wake up and fight the battle of sin. You wake up and enjoy being his. And when you joy being his, righteousness begins to produce its fruit to holiness. And we can't even talk about how you can live without a conscious awareness of sin, how you can go on and not even be convicted in your relationship with the Holy Spirit because there's a purity in your heart and you're not meaning anything wrong and you're just living in God. And as you grow, you get more sensitive to things that you didn't perceive before, but it's amazing how God will grow you up into him. You can't talk about it in the church, Harley, because everybody thinks we sin about the time we wake up. And when you believe that, you'll never truly walk in righteousness. That's why a lot of times sincere lives don't change a lot in their actions. Because they keep believing they are what they did instead of they are what he accomplished. Making sense to you? How can you die to sin and keep boasting in a false humility in your ability to commit it as if it's always our resume? How can Romans 6 say you're free from sin if you can't be? The Bible isn't lying. I'm about ready to. Do you know how much I'm concerned we interpret scripture through our own lives? And we make the scripture say what matches where our lives have been instead of the scripture saying where Jesus' life has been. Do you know how much we get tricked following each other while we say we're following him? Do you know how many people say, well, that was Jesus? If that comment is true, then why would he say, follow me? Because there's no way we can. He doesn't even want you to say, well, that was Jesus. He's name above every name. God has raised him and exalted him above every name when he raised him from the dead. But when you look at his earthly life, his earthly ministry, the Jesus you're following as a model of God in a man He doesn't want you to put him on a pedestal. He wants you to realize his spirit is willing to follow where Jesus went and take you there like he took him there. He doesn't want you to put him on a pedestal in his earthly ministry. Todd was talking about Jesus coming as a man. People get so mad when you preach that. The deception is that if all you ever see him as is God, you have nothing to follow because you can't follow God. But you can follow a man empowered by God. Why would God in Acts 10, 38 have to anoint Jesus of Nazareth? He's talking about the man, Jesus of Nazareth. He had to anoint him with the Holy Spirit and power. Why? Because he made himself of no reputation. He laid it all down. God would not have to anoint God. God would be anointed. He shared an example where Jesus was tempted at all points. You can't tempt God. How could Jesus be tempted if he came as God? He had the ability to follow the desires of man, but he didn't have the ability because he was selfless, not just because he was God. 
See, selflessness is the taking away of the platform for flesh desire. The reason he wants you to deny yourself because you can't seek first the kingdom of God. There was never a sin committed since the beginning of time that wasn't hinged on man's self-centered desire. If you take away selfishness, you take away the desire. If you seek ye first the kingdom of God, you're not seeking ye first the pleasures of your flesh. How can you seek first the kingdom of God and feed your flesh with sin? Come on, I'm just making you think a little. Okay, does God ever slumber? Where was Jesus in the boat? Hmm. Hmm. So God never slumbers, but maybe he takes a nap now and then if it's necessary to prove a point. Come on, how many examples do we need? He came as a man, let's stop fighting over it. Honestly, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not mad at anybody. I'm not, I don't mind saying this, I'm not even picking a fight. It just doesn't matter, I'm not picking a fight. I'm just telling you, people that watch every word to criticize every single thing they don't agree with are doing exactly what they did when Jesus walked the streets. And honestly, the people that have so many bad things to say about everything everybody's saying that's pursuing to do something in the name of the Lord doesn't know Jesus like they're claiming to because Jesus doesn't even do that. Do you know how many people I've seen mad over disagreements, over doctrine? I'm talking mad. I've seen hatred in so-called Christians. That's a good sign you don't know him at all. Like, if you think I'm telling something wrong right now, why would you hate me and get mad and frustrated? Because you're causing people to stumble. No, you're already stumbled because you have the ability to hate me. If, if you loved like God loved, you'd be concerned for me. You'd probably fast and pray till God would wreck me and change my life because I'm a living soul. And you'd probably hurt for me and feel bad for me if I'm that lost. Because when I was yet a sinner, Jesus came. And when I sinned and my sin abounded, grace came greater. It didn't say, boy, God was so ticked off with Dan Moeller when he lived in his flesh and so mad he just about gave up on him three or four times. And it's good he got saved when he did because God was ticked. <laughs> no, nope, it said that he so loved me. Because the whole time I was living in blindness, he said, boy, that is not who you are. I know who you are from the beginning, and I have the price paid, and the blood is speaking better things, and I'm drawing you unto me because I love you, boy. Man, I don't know if you did this, but when I was 19, my, my fiance was 23. I wanted to sleep with her. She was 23, and I was 19, and I thought that was amazing. I wanted to sleep with her. I wasn't thinking Jesus. She was safe for six months. I didn't care. She's 23, I'm 19, none of my friends have a 23-year-old in their life, and I'm thinking, i got to make this happen. Just being honest. Of course I told her I love her. That's how you make it work. Because most of us need to believe we're lovable. So we say, I love you, and it's manipulation, and it gets us what we need and want. So when you're 19, saying, I love you, I don't even know what I'm saying. Because I'm not even born again. I have no capacity to love. The Spirit of God isn't even in me. God is love. All I can be is self-centered. The only thing I can do for her is live at her expense and get her to scratch my itch, meet my need, and make me feel like a man. But we've seen enough romantic Hollywood movies and the feelings are real. So we make the most of it and we have our high moments but they usually don't outweigh the low. Oh, it's so quiet in here. <laughs> Look, I was 19, I wanted to sleep with her. It was the only thing on my mind. I didn't love her, I just wanted to score, man. And I was hoping it would work out and I was hoping I could sleep with her again and again and again and maybe she'd be my wife and I'd just have her with me. We'd never have to go to bed alone. It's just where I was, man, I was lost, I was selfish. Thank you for being humble. <laughs> I love you is the three most misused, manipulated words on this planet. 
It's caused more pain than it ever has blessing. It's been spoken in deceit a thousand million more times than it's ever been said in truth. It's usually driven by a feeling in the moment. Sorry, I'm not a romantic. I want to walk in truth. And love is an I love you. Do you love me? Love is I love you. And I give my life for you to bring out the best in you. Come hell or high water, I don't change my mind because I see the value of your life. And on your toughest, most struggling day, I know you're more. That's what I have now with my wife. He loves that girl. He made her for his image. And if she's not realizing it, I should probably love her if I realize it. Not get frustrated. Say, why don't you get a grip? Well, you need to believe the gospel. You make my life tough. I got enough pressure as it is. I got enough on my plate. Todd, can you help and pray for my wife? If she don't change soon, I'm going to break. <laughs> you ever hear anybody talk like that? I'm a pastor. I got those phone calls way more than I should have ever got them. It just told me every time I got those phone calls, we have no idea what we're doing. We don't understand the gospel, so we ought to preach it louder and clearer. <laughs> so I started to preach it louder and clearer. <laughs> First night I had a chance, I moved on my wife, man. I was going to make this thing happen. I was sliding in. She looked at me and said, what are you doing? I was like, you're 23. What do you mean, what am I doing? That's what I'm thinking. I didn't say that. She just came out of two long-term relationships. She wanted to get her life right. She went to a church and got born again. The last thing she needed in her life was a selfish, driven 19-year-old that had one agenda. But because she was vulnerable and because she had need in her life and needed to feel like somebody and her esteem wasn't really established in Jesus, she tolerated it. She said, what are you doing? And I laughed and kind of said, what am I doing? And I just kept making my move. And she said, what are you doing? And I stopped and looked at her like, what am I doing? Like, duh. Like, what do you mean? She looked at me so serious and said, we're Christians. Because I told her I was a Christian because it helped. <laughs> you know, people that know me, they say, you tell these stories. I can't even picture you like that. I said, I'm born again. <laughs> I'm not that. that, that is, there is none of that even in me, even a little bit. I'm not the same man. My eyes are changed and because my eyes are changed, my life's changed. My motives change because my motives change. I don't even have to think about my actions. They follow my motive. I have never worked on my life. I've let God work on my heart. So that night, she said, we're Christians. And I'm like, duh. I was so mad at the gospel. I was so mad at God. I was so mad at the Bible. I'm thinking the Bible is in my face again, cutting off my experience. So I played it cool. I said, oh yeah, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, look, it's just what you do to me. I can't help it. You're so like, so I'm trying to compliment her to smooth it. Like, you're just so hot. You just, oh. But I was so mad. <laughs> so when I got home, I was so mad till I got home because I thought this thing was going to happen. And I was like, woohoo. And when I got home, I was so mad. So I couldn't find my Bible because I didn't know where it was because I didn't even know if I really still had one from when I was a kid. <laughs> but I looked and I found it in the, under my underwear. So dis dishonoring. I had my... Bible under my whitey tidy fruit of looms. <laughs> my Bible was under my fruit of the looms, man. It was under my underwear. I was throwing underwear, man. Bible. Ooh. Well, why'd you want to get your Bible? Did you want to read it? No, I wanted to scream at it like a maniac. 
That's what I did. I held my Bible in my bedroom and I said, you make me so mad. You make me so mad. Because I just came out of a relationship with an 18-year-old girl who didn't have a dad and I was smart. Yeah? Come on, is it okay if I'm real or do you want me to like... You know why it's so quiet in here? Some of us so relate that you're nervous. You feel it, don't you? I was smart. She didn't have a dad, and that's why I was in there. Because I was smart. She was a Christian, and I went to the same church. But I wasn't thinking Jesus. And we was calling it love. And one day she said, you know, I don't like what's going on here. And I'm just not seeing God in this. And I don't even know who I am and where I am anymore. And I don't even know who you are. And I'm like, whatever. I'll just move on then because I'm not ready for none of that. And I left and I was mad because I thought the gospel got in my way again. See, people see my life and hear it. Maybe you need to hear these stories to see what God does he takes some of your greatest twists, deceptions, perversions, and weaknesses and turns them into your most incredible strengths. And because that stuff I'm telling you is so dead to my life, it doesn't, it's not even an issue. Like, it's not even an issue. I got home, I screamed at my Bible. I said, I hate you. I hate that I know what you say. I hate that I read you, that I heard what you say. And I was just screaming at it. And I said, you're always in my face. You always get in my face. I'm screaming at it like it's a friend or somebody I'm mad at. I'm in my bedroom screaming at a book called the Bible. In my heart, I was screaming to God. And I was like, Watch what I said. You're always in my face. You're always in my face. You never let me do what I want to do. Hello? And I'm tired of it. Get out of my face. Do you hear me? Get out of my face. And I took it and I threw it as hard as I could against the wall. I went out to a friend's house that had a bottle of vodka that wasn't even open, and I determined when I was young I was never gonna drink because my dad was an alcoholic, and I wasn't gonna say, well, I drink because my dad drank. I had a good reason to never drink because I saw the hell it brought into my home. But on that night, I crossed the line because I was gonna teach God a lesson. Silly, silly 19-year-old stuff. Cracked that thing open and drank till I didn't remember nothing. I really taught God a lesson. Probably had him straightened out by morning. <laughs> never told my girlfriend, who's my wife now, I never told my girlfriend about it. I just didn't want her to know that my intentions were so twisted. So for nine months in our engagement, I pushed her as far as I could. I thought, well, if she's not going to let me hit the home run, I'll just have a good batting average. We'll get singles and doubles. We might even get a triple here and there. I might get thrown out at home, but hey, if I make it to third base, that's better than nothing. So I made her cry a lot in nine months and violated her conscience. And you can't let this happen. We got to wait. We do, do, do. Oh, it's okay. Look, we're going to get married. I love you. Yeah, I just love you. I love you so much. That's garbage. If I loved her, I'd honor who she was in God, and I wouldn't make her cry. If I loved her, I'd never live at her expense. I'd lay down my life. Hello? You know, when you talk like this, you ain't just talking to the young people. I've learned as a pastor, man. People in their 50s have all this stuff going on, man. Spouse leaves them, they get insecure, and they, choom, they grab somebody, and they're doing things they didn't do when they were young. Oh, I've pastored long enough to find out. I'm not shocked by much, but it does grieve my heart that we live in that kind of emptiness. You say, why are you talking like this? Because it's so quiet. I didn't even know we were going here. I'm kind of freaked out when I preach. I'm like, what are we doing? God, really? You have no idea the conversations I have when I'm preaching. 
It happens all the time. I'm like, are you serious? Are we doing this? Go back out. I'm like, mayday, mayday. <laughs> and the words just keep coming. And I'm like, oh, okay. But it affected us right out of the gate. It sent a message to her that I was with her for one reason. And I'd smooth it over. I, I'm not with you for that reason. I could go to a bar if I wanted to. I could find somebody. I want to marry you. I don't just want to sleep with you. I want to marry you. When we got married, I quit going to church. 13 years later, I was at work. And even though I screamed at my Bible at 19 and threw it against the wall and told God to get out of my face, he just walked up the aisle to me and spoke to my heart and changed my life forever. 13 years later, after a whole lot more sin, darkness, selfishness, and hurting her. You know what's cool about God? When he came in, I didn't even know it was him. He just spoke to my mind. And I thought it was my mind. And I tried to get rid of it, and it came right back, and there was no escaping it. I didn't know till after it was the Lord. I just thought, why am I thinking about this stuff? Why am I thinking? Why do I even care? But you know what I think is so cool? I mean, because the word of God is God. God and his word are one. The word was with God in the beginning, and Jesus is the word, right? So you could get technical and say, I threw the Lord against the wall. So you know what's cool is he didn't, like, come into work that night. Hey, can we talk? I mean, I've been wanting to come a long time ago. It's been taking me a while to get back on my feet. <laughs> hey, I can't believe you did this to me. <laughs> I'm being silly, man. You cannot stop the mercy of God. If he'd have took me at my word at 19 years old, he'd have got out of my face and I'd have lived in darkness, lasciviousness, and I'd have died not knowing him. And I honestly think when I did that, he wanted to get me all the more. Because where sin abounded, grace is greater. Because he doesn't get mad like we got mad because we didn't grow up loving, we grew up needing love. He is love. He ain't seeking his own. He's seeking me to be restored and become what he paid for. So every time I live outside of that, he grieves for me and groans for me and weeps for me and pursues me because he wants to bring me into truth. And I grew up hearing that God's mad at me and why do you follow the devil? You just broke the heart of God. Well, you just got mad. God really mad. Well, why do you? Well, you just hurt God. I learned later none of that's true. None of that's true. You're trying to put a false conviction on your child and you're teaching them the image of God that isn't even true. I screamed at my Bible and threw my Bible against the wall. 13 years later, God comes into work and says, you don't even know that God is really real. You don't even know that God is really real, if he's really real. Isn't it amazing he didn't say, hey, you ain't been to church for a while. Hey, when's the last time you read your Bible, pal? <laughs> Haven't heard you pray in a long time. He said, you don't know God. Because that's what he wants. He wants you to know him. I read in my Bible, I know I'm right on this, eternal life isn't a prayer that takes you to heaven. It's John 17, 3, it's knowing the Father. Jesus said it, I know I'm right, because Jesus said it. He said, this is eternal life. It's not the prayer on the back of the track. Eternal life is knowing him. You know what 1 John 4 says, 7 and 8? It says, beloved, let us love one another. Why? Because God is love. Watch, and everyone Everyone who loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He who loveth not just doesn't know God. Didn't say you don't go to church. Didn't say you don't serve in the ministry. Didn't say you don't go on a mission trip once a year and feed the poor and hungry. But it did say, if you don't love, there's one reason, not two. One. You don't know him. 
which tells me it's impossible to know him and not become more like him. It's impossible to know him and him not to just absolutely rub off on you. He he says, if you don't love, there's one reason, not two. You don't know him. He didn't say you don't see your need for a savior. I realize he didn't say you're not born again, or he didn't say that he left out the born part. You're, You're born of him. He didn't say anything about that. He just said you don't know him. But he doesn't say that you don't see your need for a savior. He doesn't say that you don't believe in Jesus. He didn't say that you didn't see the conviction of your sins. But what he did say is if you don't love, it's because you don't know him. And about four times in that chapter, he says, he is love, he is love, he is love. If he loved us this way, ought we not love one another? It's love, love, love. And then he says, love is perfected in this, that we have boldness in the day of judgment. Now we're down at verse 17. The whole thing is he is love, he is love, he is love, he is love. We have boldness in the day of judgment. Well, if you look at the day of judgment in your Bible, there ain't a lot of folks having boldness. It's a day of gloom, darkness, weeping, despair. People are crying out to be consumed by the rocks and the trees, lest they face the glory of his presence. It's a day of doom. It's a day of dread. All those phrases you can find in the Bible talking about that day. And the Bible says you and I, when we're perfected in love, are going to have boldness in that day. Why? Because as he is, so are we right now, right here in this world. Why? Because we don't just sing to him, we know him. Oh. You get it? So he's going to come and see himself in us and his heart in us and his life in us and his nature in us. And it's, we're sealed for that day. He's, he's going to come and say, oh, they're definitely mine. They're my kids. Don't they look like me? But we don't look like each other. <laughs> but man, don't they look like me? Ain't that awesome? This is good, flat out good preaching right here. It's all through the scriptures, this love thing. First Timothy 1 5, the goal of your instruction is love. Guys, if we miss becoming love, we've missed the whole point of why he came. He did not come to pay your bills, he did not come to make sure you get the job you hope. He came to restore your nature back to love, your motive back to love, to get self out of you so love can live there. Why? Because there's no selfishness in love and there's no love in selfishness. There's no relationship between the two. You can't be some of the one and some of the other. Love doesn't seek. That's why it takes no record of wrong. Then why are we busted up by each other? Why do we have memories and stories of who did what and he said, and I wouldn't be if they didn't? Because we haven't been perfected in love. Love thinks no evil. Why do we have to avoid the appearance of evil if it's only the appearance of evil and not evil itself? Why do we have to avoid it? Because God's so humble and loving, he doesn't want people to stumble because they think evil. Why do you think evil? Because you're not perfected in love. Because love doesn't think evil. Love believes the best. Isn't that something? So we're supposed to be rooted and grounded in the love of God. We're supposed to know his love, see his first love, and love him in response because he's amazing. So we get rooted and grounded in love, and we understand the measuring stick of God's love is Christ crucified, so our circumstances have nothing to do with whether God loves us or not. The fact that Christ already came settled it. We're rooted and grounded in that truth. You can't say, man, where's God's love in this? I thought God loved me. Why is this all falling apart? How come this is happening? I started this company. I thought it was supposed to work. I thought it was God's voice. God, if you love me, why'd you let me get into all this? You 
You are such a sitting duck in that place. You're so vulnerable. You're feeling sorry for yourself. You're accusing him. You're missing the whole point of why he's in you. And now you're challenging love and faith works through love. When you can't see love, all you can be is desperate and use the language. You reduce this to principles you're applying, hoping something changes, but you're missing the whole covenant thing. Come on, if faith works through love and love is in question, you can't live in faith. You're driven by need at best. Ooh, I can feel that's not happy to people. No, that's, there's a weird feeling on the, in the room. Faith worketh through love. If the love of God is in question, how can you ever live by faith? You're rooted and grounded in love. If love is in question based on the unfolding of life circumstances, how can you ever be established in, in love if love's revealed as time unfolds? God does not have to prove his love to you every day through circumstances. He proved it through his son crucified. Jesus crucified is the measure. And people say, well, if God loved me, then why did this happen when I was five and then this and now? And you don't understand. My life has been a living hell and you're telling me God loves me. If God loved me, why did I have to go through all these things? I think we ask the wrong questions. They're self-serving questions. Because I always ask people a question when they talk like that. I say, well, how about, I learned this from Jesus. Let me ask you a question. You know when Jesus said that to people? Let me ask you a question. You know the only time he ever did it? Is when they were coming from a wrong heart and didn't understand. When they either had manipulation, trappings, or whatever going on, and their question was coming from not a good place. He never answered it. He always said, let me ask you a question, and he turned the tables on what was happening. Watch this. Well, if God loved me so much, why did he let, and how come, and I don't, well, if God didn't love you, why did he send his son when you were yet a sinner? See, you got to get them back to where love is found so that they never let life speak louder than truth because truth is what makes you free. Are you with me? It's just important. So we're going to love one another. Love is perfected in this. That we have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. Isn't that cool? You see why power and love conferences are awesome? Because it's all about walking in love and moving in his power. Yeah? God, you're good. Go to Matthew with me, please, 24. Man, I don't even know how we got here. We're just going to be here. It's so funny because none of this stuff right here even crossed my mind today or the whole evening. I actually thought I knew where we were heading. I don't know why I thought because it's never what I thought. I'm on a journey with you. It's not a joke. I get up here. I have no clue. I open my mouth and I'm like, really? Whoa. Yeah. Oh. It's the way I pray. I, I say, God, I don't have a need to preach. It's not about my sermon. It's about what you're saying. You know the room. I prayed it over Todd last night. He humbled, humbly asked me to pray. I went, man, I'm just going to pray what I always pray. And it's not religious. God, if they handed you a mic, if Lifestyle Christianity handed you a mic and you stood here in person and addressed this crowd, you know exactly what you'd say. You wouldn't even have to think. So let those be the only words that come out of my mouth. Please, God, I have no need to preach. I have no need to impress anyone. I'm impressed with you. Would you speak to us tonight? That's what I do when I'm kneeling during worship. That's what I'm saying to the Lord. He said, well, you don't study and prepare your sermon ahead of time. If that's the grace on your life, go for it. One's not more anointed than the other. He's just never, ever told me to never, ever do that. He said, only ever preach out of who I am in your life, and it'll carry weight, and it'll affect the hearts of men. That's what he told me. He said, never read your Bible to preach a sermon. Only read your Bible to know me. 
and only ever speak out of who I am in your life. That's why I'm so passionate. That's why I can't help the intensity in my voice sometimes. That's why it looks like I'm half going sometimes. I, I have fun with it. People are like, is that dude out of his mind? I'm like, no, I'm probably out of yours. It's just a funny thought. Look at verse 9 of 24. I'll just jump in. We can get away with this. He's talking about the end times. He's talking about a certain time coming down the road for sure, right? Destruction of the temple, the signs of the times, and the end of the age. That's my subtitle. Okay? Let's, 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 let's look at verse 4. Take heed that no one deceives you. Okay, so how do I know if somebody's deceiving me? Well, go back to Ephesians 4. See, if you don't study and show yourself approved, you'll get thrown all over the place and listen to everything that people preach. Ephesians 4 says there's a reason for the gifts in the body of Christ. We call it the five-fold ministry. He said the reason for these gifts is so that they function in a way that we all come to the unity of the faith and are no longer tossed to and fro by everything that's being said. Growing up in him in all things to the full measure of the stature of Christ. Isn't that amazing? So it sounds like we are on a journey in a race. We are heading somewhere. Paul talked about it. Hey, I haven't arrived, but I'm going after him. There's one thing, not two, one, not two, one. I don't look behind. I'm going after him. Yeah? Yeah? And I'm going to apprehend and lay a hold of that thing which he laid a hold of me for. Do you hear that Jesus has intention in obtaining you? And Paul said, I'm going to live what he bought me for. That sure beats incorporating him into your life and sweet old by and by when the roll's caught up yonder, I'll be there. I mean, I'm not mad at the song, but that's not going to love the sleep by sentiment. And hey, I'm saved, brother. Paul said, I have not apprehended this thing yet, but I'm going to. I'm going after him. I'm moving forward. I'm pressing in. I'm going after this thing that he obtained me for. The only way I'm going to get there is if I'm getting what lies behind and reaching for what lies ahead. What's he trying to say? I'm not Lot's wife or nobody else's bride. I'm his bride. I'm looking up from whence comes my help. I am not going to get stuck between where I'm delivered and where I'm called. I'm going after him. Yeah? Now watch what he says in Philippians 3 right after that. He said, let as many of you as are mature, have this same mind in you. And if anybody think otherwise, I pray God even reveal this unto you. But regardless, nevertheless, no matter what level you have arrived, let's all walk in the same mind, in the same love and or heart, and have follow all those who we have as a pattern and example and follow. Sounds pretty easy, pretty intense. We got a goal. The unity of faith, no longer tossed to and fro. Come on, guys. Church building almost on every corner in this country. Why? Mainly because we can't agree, not because God said. You got churches starting in basements because they're mad at their leaders. You got all kinds of reasons. There's a church building on, there's denominations, there's things, and some of them have a neat heritage and a good thing, but there is a lot of tents, camps, and things dug that God never inspired because men can't agree. People try to upstage and outdo in their names and who, you know, you got you know, the, the, the river, and then you got the glorious river, and then you got the flooded glorious river, and it's just like, <laughs> I'm just being a little, I'm trying to make a point. <laughs> you look at some of the names, man. The names of work sometimes give it away. Just think what you say when you do an ad like this. 
Tired of church, tired of every day, blah, 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 blah. Come over and check out this new thing God's doing, blah, 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 blah. What you're doing is you're dishonoring everybody around that is called. And you're saying, hey, we got it. Nobody else does. If you're tired of checking everywhere else out, you didn't check us out yet, why don't you stop in? That sounds a little weird. That's like you trying to get them there instead of you just going out and as you go, walk in love. Yeah? I remember being in a bus stop at Seattle or Everett, Washington years ago. Yeah, it was Everett, Washington. Bus stops, man. It was like a lot of people at this bus stop because it was easier to ride buses and get through the town. And I had a couple people with me and I said, man, look at all them people. And the bus wasn't coming for like seven minutes. It was on a sign, a countdown, just like they're counting down my preaching up there. <laughs> it's unsettling. It's like every time I look up, it's less and less. As I'm talking, it's less. It was seven minutes, and, 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 and it was amazing what came out of my mouth because I didn't have a plan. I said, let's just walk over there. There's like, there were so many people at this bus stop waiting to get on this bus. I knew the bus was gonna be full when, we, when they'd all get on. It was a lot of people getting on this bus. I said, we walked over. And I, I lifted up my voice and I said, hey guys, excuse me, look, the bus isn't coming for almost seven minutes. Just give me your heart for just a second and please just don't turn me off, don't get cynical, just hear me out. And they're all like, what is this guy doing? And they're already cynical. And they're like, cuckoo. And I said, listen, and emotions flooded me. It was heart-wrenching, emotions flooded me. And it, this is what came out of my mouth. I didn't pre-think it, it came out in the moment. I figured I was just gonna step out in faith and when I opened my mouth, God was gonna do something cool. Well, guess what he said through my heart? First thing I wanna do is apologize to every one of you standing here on behalf of the church of Jesus Christ that we built buildings on every corner across this land and expected you to come and failed to come where you are. Would you please forgive us for doing our own thing and fighting in the process? And we maybe failed to even come to where you are. And they're like, oh, it's a Christian thing. He's trying to snare us. He's gonna cast a net in a minute. He's gonna want us to pray his prayer and nod our heads. Don't think they're not on to us. <laughs> I said, listen, I know you might not understand this, but the bus ain't coming for a few minutes. It just came right out of my heart. I said, if there's anybody in this circle of people that has a physical impairment, a situation in health, I believe with all my heart, God wants to heal you in front of everybody and just reveal his goodness and his love to this whole group. So we would love to pray for you right now before the bus gets here. Please don't turn me off. And two guys on bikes were getting real cynical. And I was just like, be careful guys, man. God's here, he's gonna move. This little girl comes out of the huddle. And she's walking like this. And I said, hey honey. She said, you mean there's hope for me? And it makes you cry. And you say, hope, he's the Lord. You said, what happened to you? She said, 10 or uh, 27 years ago, I was in a car accident when I was three. I didn't get a, some of the proper treatments I needed because of our family and costs and things and found out that things weren't right as I aged and now I'm 30. So I can't bend, I can't use my legs right. I've just never healed from this accident. I said, oh my goodness, and you're crying in your heart. And you know in your heart Jesus is Lord, and you've prayed for people. You haven't seen everything you've ever prayed for change right now, but you're in that moment. You've cried out. You're believing he's here. It's part of faith. Yeah? So I laid hands on her and prayed for her and I had about four people with me and they're just agreeing and praying and everybody's, now everybody's attention is had because this guy's gonna look really foolish in a minute or we're gonna be freaked out. <laughs> so people have all different things going on right now. 
my, my 70 congregation of 70, they, everybody's watching. So I just prayed a simple prayer. And I said, amen. And I said, honey, I want you to bend over. Touch the macadam. She looked at me like, I just told you I can't. You got to understand, she's been that way for 27 years. I said, honey, it's okay. We prayed. I'm believing he's here. Just bend over. If it hurts, stop. If you can't, stop. But if you keep going, just keep going. It was the most beautiful thing you're going to see. She, in slow motion, went. And when she got to where she knows she can't, she went. And then she went further and went like this. And then she went. And she came up in slow motion. It works. It really works. And I said, it works. It's not a method, honey. He's the Lord. He's Jesus. He's King. He's alive. And I started to worship him and, and everybody's going. And I had four guys, people with me. And I said, right now, before this bus gets here, cause it's coming, man. And we were down to like 37, 30, kind of like my clock does 36. 35, 34, I mean, we're in under a minute, bus is coming. I said, if you have impairment, if you have sickness, you have something in your body, come on, raise your hands. Me and my friends, we're gonna pray for you. And hands just shot up everywhere. And I said, go ahead. And my, my four guys were like, fire! No, I, I said, so you guys like that, you like that. But uh, there was so much that took place at that bus stop. Just lifting the voice and just trusting he's good. If you got theological hangups, if you're hurt because your mom died of sickness and you're offended, then you can't lift your voice because you got issues, not covenant. And you're loving this more than you're loving him and what he called you to and created you for. If you're mad at God because your dad was drunk and never loved you your whole childhood because you were touched wrong at a very young age, what does any of that have to do with the one that's living on the inside of me right now? He took away my story to give me his. He's a way better author than the devil was. His ending is amazing. I'm going to stick with his story. Not, well, you don't know what it was like when I was growing up, brother. Well, you're 42. Why are you still talking about that? I asked the Lord not long ago. I said, why do people hold on to their story so tight? And why is everybody writing a book about their story? He said, because it's the only place people have ever found any sense of identity, whether good or bad. That's what he told me, and I believe I heard him clear. That's pretty intense. You're not where you've been. You're not what's happened to you. You're not who did and didn't do what to you. You're what he did for you and what he wants to do through you. Are you good with that? Let's do this quick, and we got to do something quick. It'll be fun. We're going to have fun. I'm having fun now, but we're going to have fun in a minute. Take heed that nobody deceives you. See, I read that one line and then I talked that whole time. You see the trouble I have? A long time ago, the Lord said, I want you to receive communion every day and start your day with communion and I'll give you understanding and hold up the body and hold up the blood and scriptures will all come together and come alive and I'll help teach you through communion what I've accomplished. And it was really an amazing season. But I had a problem because I was a few weeks in and I had office hours and I had a schedule and I get up really early. But I'd be holding the bread 
and I'm 45 minutes in and haven't even eaten it yet. And I still got the blood to talk about. <laughs> I'm 45 minutes in on the body and I still haven't received it because it's just so good. And, and I still got the blood to talk about. And it started to be almost two hours to receive communion. So I said, I think this thing's in my heart by now. So I probably don't have to take the elements. I'll just live in the truth. But taking the elements took me to that truth. Are you with me? Yeah. Do you know how you discern if a spirit's not from the Lord? If it doesn't acknowledge Jesus came in the flesh. Why? Because the devil never wants you as a man, a human, a woman, to understand what he paid for, accomplished, and achieved through his flesh. So it doesn't want to acknowledge that he came in the flesh because of the dividend you receive. Ain't that something? <laughs> so he must have did something amazing. If the barometer is they don't acknowledge Jesus came in the flesh, you think it would just be that he's not Lord. He paid for redemption. He's the redeemer. If Satan can cover up redemption, he's covered up the work of the cross. Honestly, I'm convinced of this. You, please don't get mad at me. Don't waste your time and get mad at me. But if you choose to, you can. I am convinced at this point in my life that Satan could care less if people go to church, wave flags, dance on the team, or play on the worship team. He cares when you walk in love, when you love not your own life unto death. I'm not even sure that he doesn't encourage people to go to church sometimes because it's so dangerous when you get there if you don't get the truth. It's very risky. You become religious. That's tragic. You let church attendance take the place of knowing him. That's a bummer. You let the ministry you serve in take the place of knowing him. You let your identity revolve around what you do for him instead of what you become in him. Tragic. He is not threatened when we go to church. He's threatened when you give your life to Jesus and start becoming more and more like him. Yeah? Watch this. Take heed that no one deceives you. <laughs> Did we read that before? For many are going to come in my name saying I'm the Christ and it'll deceive many and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that no, you're not troubled. Hello? For all these things must come to pass, but the end's not yet. Nations gonna rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There's famines, there's pestilence, earthquakes. I mean, you can see all these things that happened in our lifetime already. True? Okay. All these are the beginning of sorrows. They'll deliver you up to tribulation, kill you. You'll be hated by nations for my namesake, and then many will be offended. Ooh. Uh-oh. How many? many? Man, we better make sure many isn't many. So we ought to keep preaching this gospel. I was crying one day because I read, many will come to me and say in that day, but Lord, Lord. I lost it in my bedroom. You have no idea. I cried so hard. I said, Lord, what's the use? I said, this is prophecy. It's red letters. We're plowing ground, we're sowing seed, and you said it. Many are going to come in that day and say this. What, what am I even doing this for? Like, what hope do I have when I'm reading this? It hit me in the bedroom like, you said many. If many are going to come and say this, the Lord is so wise. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overreacting, I'm crying, I'm sobbing. And I'm like, what's the use of even if many are going to come? Like, what's the big deal? What am I all excited about? He said, Dan, you keep doing what you're doing so the many isn't many. And here's the impression I got. In the love of God, one is too many. Ain't that 
something. That is Jesus. I'm convinced. How many are going to be offended? Many. They're going to betray one another, get ticked off, caught up in rightness. I can't believe they said that. Hurting Christians are going to get hurt Christians to rally around them and support their case. Do you ever notice how hurting people gravitate to people that understand their pain and hurt too? Call it their support system when it's a guarantee to stay the same. If what you're thinking and believing isn't producing life, you're deceived. If you're grayed out, bummed out, hurt, discouraged, disappointed, you're not believing the truth because he came to give you life and life more abundantly. And if the way you're processing isn't producing life and keeping the light bright, you're thinking outside of him. The biggest trap is turning inward in your life and feeling sorry for yourself. It's the loneliest party you've ever been to and a few people that live that way will be your friends. You might even start a home group. <laughs> Jesus, help me. <laughs> Shoo. I got to drink that one away. <laughs> oh, God. Many are going to be offended, betray one another, and hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up. Why are false prophets on the heels of people being offended? Because their ears are going to be subject to hear. They become vulnerable in offense. You'll hear through the screen of offense and words you would have never heard. You'll buy into because of your heart. Here's, here's the kicker. And because lawlessness will abound, that means men will make the actions of others their excuse. Well, you don't know what they did to me. Well, you don't know what they put me through. Well, you can't trust nobody. Well, no wonder I got walls up. I'm tired of being hurt. I don't let people close. I got four cats and three dogs because I don't love people and they never hurt me. Pets are such an idolatry on the earth right now. Oh. People hate people and will pay thousands of dollars to help a sick cat. There's show after show on about helping sick animals. And there's people dying and starving and naked every day. I don't know if you understand. Did you ever see a cat, how their eyes are shaped? They ain't the same as every other animal. They came after Adam ate the tree. Cats. <laughs> there were no cats. Adam ate the tree, and the cats just popped up out of the ground. Look at their eyes, man. They're the wrong way. It's like, come out. Ah! Look. If you have a cat, be honest. I know you're cat lovers and some of you don't like me right now, but, but think about this. Cats just lay on the corner of your couch like they own your house. They're lord over your house. You scratch them, pet them. They meow when they want something and they're just, they're lazy and own the house. Dogs, on the other hand, no. <laughs> I'm messing with you. I don't hate cats. I would just never buy one. <laughs> or rescue one. I'll just pray from a distance. No, I'm just having fun. People are serious about their animals. There is more affection put on animals than there is the need of humanity. And it's because lawlessness has abounded in so many people's lives that they make where people aren't their excuse for where they are. They let the sin against them have the right to produce sin in them instead of overcoming evil with good. It's right here. Watch. Because lawlessness will abound. He's letting you know it will abound. Don't you let lawlessness decide your heart. 
let his goodness have already captured it. See, when this happens, if you're walking in love, you're untouched. If you're a Christian for your sake, when this happens, you'll be wondering why God's letting it happen and what did I do wrong and what door did I open and why do you let him treat me that way if you love me? You show me one person that ever had that mentality that was encouraged in producing life. It won't happen. You know the analytical thing I touched a little bit this morning? I have never in my life met a person professing to be analytical that admitted they were blessed and free and filled with God's spirit. They were always overthinking and struggling and had questions. I've never seen a person confessing, almost priding themselves in being an analytical person that was walking in a confession of blessed. That should be a warning. Yeah? Because lawlessness will abound, watch, the love of, here we go, will what? Now that's fascinating because that's telling you that people were walking in love. They had a revelation of love. But they got their eyes on lawlessness and it began to overshadow and outweigh the love that they had become. Are you with me? It doesn't say they never knew love in the first place so they were sitting ducks. It said the love they knew went cold because they didn't take earnest heed of the things they heard. And they got their eyes on what was wrong and they missed what was made right. And they failed to see that they were created to be a response in the situation, not a recipient of the situation. So they took on the situation instead of shine into it. Are you with me? Watch. Lawless is going to unbound, and the love of many will grow cold. So what is the purpose of the false prophet thing and all the lawlessness abounding and Satan moving in people to get all this stuff to happen? Is he trying to give you a rough day and break your heart? Is he trying to blow up your circumstances? He's after love. Because the thing that he can't defeat about God is God is love. And you and I, before we knew God, didn't deserve anything from God, and he gave us his son and his kingdom. You can't beat a God like that. There's nothing you can do to stop him except get the people to not believe it's true and receive it. Are you with me? But he who endures to the end. Now, I know people read this and freak out and they think, well, why aren't we even making it to heaven? It's always about, are we going to heaven? No, you want to make it till the end, write a legacy and bear fruit that remains. You're going to endure to the end and be saved. The word saved there means healed, delivered, protected, preserved, made whole, and kept safe and sound. Yeah? So what do you say we maintain love? What time was I supposed to be done? No. Oh, I got nine minutes left, don't I? Okay. Is it okay if I'm just a little late today? Just a little? I got to do something quick. No, this is pressing on me. You might have heard me share this before. I've never shared it a lot, but it's on me right now. I got to share this, and there's one thing we got to do, and we got to pray. I got a vision in my bedroom in about 1999, 2000. It was probably before 2000. I was in my bedroom interceding and praying. I was, it was, I was probably a pastor. It was probably 98, 99. It doesn't really matter. It was way back there. Yeah. I was in my bedroom and I was praying and I was interceding and just praying, being with Jesus. And I had a vision. It wasn't with my eyes open. I had my eyes closed and I was singing and I was praying and this vision unfolded in front of me and I stopped singing and I had music. I had a piano playing just on a CD. It was just flowing and playing and, and I was just, just had that flowing and I was just standing there just kind of probably swinging like this and the vision just unfolded. I never opened my eyes. You know what I mean? 
I saw these corridors that were dark and dingy. They were little lamps, kind of look like a movie scene when you're inside a whole bunch of caves that all meet in a big living space and or all come together. And there was little torches at the mouths of the holes. And there was all these black silhouettes and figures. And there was hysteria. It started to unfold that I could hear them. And there was cursings. And they were freaking out. This group was freaking out. And there was a tall figure in the center of the chaos and all the figures and the silhouettes that I was seeing. And he, he was standing, he was hooded, and he was just standing like this. Silent and motionless, I saw a side view. He was like this. You're in a vision, God's given you understanding. I knew it was hell, I knew it were demons, I knew it was Satan. A newspaper came through the vision. Jesus Christ raised from the dead. And a big bold exclamation point passed right through my vision. A newspaper headline, Jesus Christ raised from the dead and it just went out of the picture. And I could hear hell freaking out, screaming at Satan, you fool, we should have never followed you. We're finished now. God has brought salvation to men. Men can be filled with God's spirit. Men can walk in the authority of his name. We are destroyed, we are finished. And they were freaking out because when they saw what they did and their eyes were open and all the scriptures came to light, they were freaking out. And Satan's standing there, and it reminded me of Ziglag and David, and when the town got burned, and they took all the women and children, and they wanted to stone David, and everybody was freaking out on David, and David had to encourage himself in the Lord, and that's the scene it reminded me of, only it was demons and the devil, and he has authority, and he's, he's the devil, so he was head and shoulders above everybody, and it represented authority, and I knew who he was, and he's hooded the whole time. And all of a sudden, he lifted his face, and I saw this figure of a face, and it got a sinister look on it. And he yelled real loud, even though they were all freaking out, and they looked like they were turning on him. He said, silence, and they all, silence. And he said, it is true we played into the hand of God. It is true that we opened the door for salvation to men. It's true that we shed innocent blood and that blood is now on the mercy seat in God's throne room. It is true that we played into the wisdom of God. He said, but we do not have to be moved and we do not have to fret. He said, we know we can't defeat God, but we know, we know we can defeat them. We have defeated them from the beginning. This is what I heard. Remember Eve? Ha, ha, ha. Remember Adam? Huh. Every man is for himself. Every man lives for himself. God has paid a price for salvation to men, but we can stop it. I want you guys to come in here. They all came in. They're in a big huddle. He says, don't worry about them building churches. Don't worry about them preaching. Don't worry about them praying. Don't worry about their gatherings. Let them gather. Just keep their hearts far from who he is. Keep them hurt. Keep them frustrated. Get them to compete. Make them argue over their beliefs. Do whatever you can to keep what he paid for becoming real to them. Keep men stuck within men and keep them the same. But let them do what they do toward God. But make sure they're hurt inside, frustrated inside and unforgiveness inside. Come on, guys. We know men. We know them from the beginning. Every man is for himself. We can do this, guys. And by the year, whatever I heard, by the year, whatever what it was, 2098, 99, it'll be no big deal. It'll be an Easter story, but there'll be no apparent change on the earth, even though God crucified his own son. And I'm standing there bawling in this vision thinking how much has this come to pass when you look at all the arguments in the church, all the division, all the stuff that has happened since that time. 
And he huddled him in and he said, we can do this. And it was like a rally before a basketball team or football team. They get somebody in the middle and get everybody fired up. Rah! And then they all run out in the field. That's what he was doing. And he said, we can do it, guys, to the four corners of the earth. Keep them blind. Keep them deceived. Make it all about them. Let their ministries be about what they're doing. Let's let them do it in the name of the Lord. But it's all about them. Keep it. And he was shouting all this stuff. He said, we can do it. And they're like, yeah. And they broke and everything went Phew! out the holes, out the caves. And Satan was standing there all by himself, still in that position, shaking his head. And I opened my eyes. And I cried for a very long time. And I asked God for mercy, and I asked God for wisdom. Here's why I told you that vision, I believe. Because I don't know, it just got big in my heart. He succeeded in that vision in many ways. When you hear somebody tell you a story like that, you have to make sure that he's not succeeding that vision in your life. When he says every man loves himself, you have to make sure he's wrong where you're concerned. When he says people don't love God, they need God, you have to make sure, no matter how much he's right, you have to make sure he's wrong where you're concerned. Are you with me? God has done the greatest thing that could be done. And there is innocent blood on the mercy seat of heaven crying out mercy upon men. His blood is speaking better things. So let's go after the better things. Amen? Amen. Okay. I want to do this quick and I want you guys to help me. I still got a minute and 33 one, 30, 29. <laughs> Better hurry. <laughs> we can do this quick. I'm way ahead of where I thought I'd be. I do this a lot. I've been doing this since the year 2000 and making it a separate thing. I have faith for it. I believe it. I have fun with it. It makes me cry. It's phenomenal how the blood of Jesus removes sin and the effects of sin. He's a redeemer. The word redemption means brought back, bought back to original value. What the blood wants to do is bring you back to the place and sit you in a seat as if you've never eaten the tree or even followed the voice. Are you with me? It's called redemption. It's called the righteous, just judgment of God. Now here's the truth about scripture. He'll take your sin and remember it no more. He'll separate it as far as the east is from the west. So will God remember your sin when you stand before him? So wherever you've been, whatever you've done that you're not ashamed of in the sense of where you're carrying shame, but when you think about it, you think, oh man, I know better now. I would, man, I, it's amazing. I can't even relate to when I did that. I was so like not who I ever want to be. You know what I'm saying? Like how many people in this room, you've done things, but now you know God, you know things, you're different. And if you could go back and change some things you did and had a chance to redo some things, there'd be different pages in your book. Yeah? Who's ever learned some hard lessons but a lesson nonetheless? Here's what's happened to people. They've done things they were never created to do and they paid a price along the way. There's people that did things a thousand times over and never seemed to get burned for it in their spirit, soul, body. There's people that made a mistake and went out of the bounds of what they said and bam, got bit for keeps. There's people that did drugs, they got something in their blood that's not cool. There's people that were promiscu and they got things in their blood that's not cool. There's other people that went to bars and slept with somebody different for weeks on end, for years on end, and never got anything in their blood. There's some people that just went out there and just got a little bit crazy for a while and boom, that thing nailed them. There's no mercy out there. There's no mercy in the realm of darkness. There's no mercy outside of God. I know some, some crazy stories where people were faithful to their spouse and, and didn't have stuff in their life and their spouse left them and they got insecure and did things they never did their whole life. And then something came upon them. There's a judgment out there, but it's not from God. Preachers will tell you it's from God, but the Bible doesn't say it is. Jesus said, I didn't come to judge you. I came that you might be saved. But know this, you'll have my word that'll judge you in that day. Here's what I'm getting at. There's people in this room, you're carrying the mark of yesterday's mistakes even though you're born again. 
You could have hurt your memory. You could have just went out and got blitzed, man. You could have just went over the edge. You could have been mad one night like I was, and you could have just went deeper than you ever went, and you've never been quite the same, and you know it's ever since that night. You don't have the same concentration. You, your mind's not the same. Your sleep's been affected. Your body's been affected. There might be something in your blood because of promiscuity. There might be something in your blood because of a dirty needle. There might be an STD. There might be hepatitis. There might be HIV. Here's my point. If you're born again and you don't do that anymore and you're saying, God, I wish that day had never come. If I could go back and do it over, I would, but I can't. So I'm going to fall on your mercy and receive your love. People will say, yeah, but brother, you made your bed. You got to sleep in it. And I'm saying, you better read your Bible. He made you a brand new bed. Like, like Jesus, listen, Jesus gives you new life. If any man be in Christ, he's a old things. Behold, power of God. Behold, how many? That doesn't sound like the STD should be there. Here's why. If God won't judge you for where you've been, then he's not going to let where you've been judge you. Why? Because you've been to him. And that changes everything. I can show you that God, while we were yet sinners, sent his son, for scarcely a man would die for a good man, and, and someone would even dare die for a righteous man. But God demonstrated his own love in this. It's Romans 5. It's there. That, that, in, that in God sent his son while we were all yet sinners. It says, if he sent his son and reconciled us through his death, how much more will he save us from wrath through his son now that he lives? Yeah? So here's what we're going to do, and we don't have to take long with it. We just need to be humble and honest. If you respond to this, it's not a shame thing. What you're saying is, you know what? I'm done carrying this thing. It's not who I am, who I ever wanted to be. I know now. I see now. I, I, this is not me. And I believe that your blood and your mercy and your grace will remove this from my life. If you were a cutter, if you went through a season and you were a cutter, and you've marked your body in places and you're carrying those scars, I'm telling you, you need to stand up tonight. Nobody's going to shame you. God can give you brand new skin. He can take those scars right off of your body. Why? Because you're not a cutter. You're his child. People say, well, brother, you just turned that into a testimony. I guess you could, but what's going to wreck you more? If he takes what you know you earned or if you just use it as a testimony, you decide. But I'm just telling you, when God makes things new, it affects you and you see his mercy and you see his love and it separates you from where you've been and it attaches you to where he's been. When you know you've earned hepatitis and it ain't in you, when you know you earned HPV or whatever it is and it ain't in you, that's a pretty big deal. Here's the other thing I want you to stay humble in. It don't matter where you've been and what you did. We're not asking anybody. We don't even need to know what's in your body. We just need to know he paid a price for your redemption. Because here's the raw truth in this room. There's so many of us that did things and deserve a mark and never got one. And there's not one person in this room that hasn't sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yeah? Yeah? So I want you to stand to your feet right where you're at. You don't have to come up here. If you're carrying a mark from yesterday's mistakes in any way, if you've hurt your organs, your bloodstream, your flesh, stand to your feet wherever you're at. Please don't take long. Please don't think about it and wait. Just stand up. Don't make, make ministers have to go fishing. Just stand up. I'm actually a very good fisherman. <laughs> I am. I catch a lot of fish. Yes. Just stand up, please. Just waiting for a couple more. Yeah, thank you. Hurry up. I got plenty of people to pray for. The reason I'm waiting is because God's not letting me move forward. Why would he make me wait? Because this is real and he wants you to stand and be humble. Thank you. I've seen eight, ten people stand up since I said that. Thank you. Do you understand what God's doing? This isn't a ministry thing. We got plenty of people to pray for. It's a blood of Jesus thing. It's a Holy Spirit thing. It's a redemption thing. 
And it's not about what people are thinking and it's not about who you're sitting beside and what they're gonna think and what did they do. Man, if they're thinking that, they need to grow up in Jesus. Come on, there's a ton of people in here, but I'm just waiting for a couple more just to get to your feet. You're carrying, honestly, there's some blood stuff going on. There's, there's five people. You're still sitting in your seat. It has to do with your blood. Five people, just jump to your feet. I don't have to see you. I'll just know when you're, you're up. But get to your feet right now. Don't stay in your chair. You all good? You up? Everybody up? Ha ha, good. You people sitting around them, just stand up and get your hand on somebody. Don't mob them, don't mug them, don't choke hold them. Just get your hands on them right now. Before you pray, I wanna ask you this question, everybody that's standing that stood. If you could go back and change some of the things you did, would you go back and do it over? When you say yes, gets what you're saying. You're saying, I ain't the person I'm remembering. I've changed. You know what God will see you for through the blood? Change. There's a gift called repentance. He lets our hearts turn. And he judges us not for where we've been, but for what we've become. And his judgment is righteous. I want you to begin to pray and say, redemption in Jesus' name and total restoration in your life. Simple stuff like that right there. Don't ask them why they stood. Don't ask them what's going on. I'm gonna pray corporately. This thing's gonna be wrapped up and done by the Spirit of God. Good church. Man, you guys are lovers. Father, I thank you for redemption all through this room. I thank you that everything that we would have hurt ourselves in is removed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, that there's redemption, spirit, soul, and body, blameless till the coming of your son. I thank you, Father, that memories are restored, minds are restored. I thank you no more night terrors. I thank you for organs working properly, livers and kidneys, God, whole and strong, lungs completely made brand new, God. Father, no matter what they ingested, no matter how many years, I thank you, you caused through the blood of your son their bodies to be unscathed and untouched as if sin never happened. Lord God, wash through the blood of every person right now. Wash through the blood of every Every person that stood that has something in their blood from yesterday. If you forgive sin, you'll remove the power of it. The blood of Jesus is speaking better things. I thank you, Father, for what you're doing through your Son by your Spirit right now. Blood, you be clean. Blood, you be free. No hepatitis, no STDs, no HIV. In the authority of Jesus' name, be left in this room. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for a clean sweep and an absolute wholeness brought to every person's life. Father, I thank you that every person that stood that was a cutter, that you begin to right now remove scars and make skin brand new. Father, even in those secret places, even across the belly line, even up on the thighs, God, I thank you that you are taking every burn and every mark and every trace of yesterday's darkness from our lives. You make all things new. And we thank you, God, for new in Jesus' name. We thank you, God, for what you're doing right now through the blood of your son. Yeah, be clean and be whole and be free. If we're praying for you, lift your hands to heaven right now, please. Say, Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me of everything I've ever done. I don't stand here guilty of sin in your presence. I stand here washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. I thank you for the redemption of the cross. I thank you that I'm not a person from yesterday. Now is the time, now is the day. Salvation has come. Say this with me, spirit, soul, and body, blameless till you come. I'm gonna live in you, you love me, and I'm gonna love you. Have your way in me. Burn a fresh fire, let me know your love, let me be your love. Holy Spirit, come. Come on, pray it. Holy Spirit, come. Empower me, infuse me with the depths of who you are, and let your great name be exalted. In Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, come. Thank you, Father. Holy Spirit, come. Yeah.
If you enjoyed this message, please visit danmolerarchive.com to find over 2,500 more messages from Dan, all organized by category, playlist, and search. Enjoy.